when you first started coaching people and, and talking about these things, how much of it was you creating your own framework, your own universe of how these things go, like literally intentionally sitting down and whiteboarding it all out or writing it all out? How much of it was just intuitive? Like you just, you would, because this, this happens to me all the time. You know, after yeah. all these years of writing and teaching and speaking, people will ask me a question and I'll just, I'll get this feeling like, say this. And I say yeah. it and it's like the most beautiful, elegant thing mm -hmm. you could have said that yeah. I can't, I don't even know if I can take authorship of it, but yeah. it's, it's exactly what they needed to hear. And I'm just yeah. curious how much of that you were experiencing in those early days. For sure. And I think, you know, I would be the first to express gratitude to life, to people, to studies that have all in their own way to whatever degree, some minor, some major contributed to my own insights and my own ability to do what I do. I would say predominantly it's the former in terms of just for whatever reasons tapped into the cosmic database of insights, like the traditional Indian seers, right? The gurus who they weren't like on their iPads, you know, <laughs> they were, they were tapped into the universal wild, wild web, you know, and they downloaded. And I feel like you, sometimes I'll be doing my mastermind, for example, my three month, like the most powerful process. I take people through this brilliant container where I teach my methodology and I coach people and then help them understand what I'm doing. There are times when I say things that I will literally almost like a timestamp for my team. I'll say, I couldn't say that any better. Right. So it's almost like they capture that because it's like Mozart, you know, like for me, the use of words, the combination of words, the intonation that are using uh, me, you know, to come out in a way that sounds like music to other people. And it transcends, as I said earlier, traditional thinking that allows somebody to have maybe heard something similar, but in a way now just lands and truly shifts the course of their whole trajectory of life. So I can't claim authorship to that either. Uh, and I'm very comfortable with that. You know, I'm a beneficiary of it. And again, one of my quotes, I say, as we express, so we experience, right? So if we express hatred, well, guess what you're feeling? When I express love, guess what you're feeling? And as I express insights, then I'm equally the beneficiary of those. And I literally sometimes when I'm with clients, I have to write down what I just said to them because I'm like, I want to reference that for myself later. So I would say the majority of things that I share, and certainly this, um, formula for, you know, awakening is a strong word, but self-realization and freeing the mind and liberating the soul is very much um, something I've tapped into. You know, it's not people like, where did you study? I'm like, you know, life, the universe. Then of course, what's been nice is things like Ayurveda, which is, you know, certainly supersedes me as five, 6,000 year old science what I was able to then do was to see the correlations between some of those insights, obviously most to do with physiology and the energies of our body and the doshas, but how they relate to some of the things that I speak to, that was just a beautiful point of confirmation more than something that I repeated. You know, it was just, oh, okay, I'm on the right track. What are some of the tenets of, of mind architecture? When you talk about being a mind architect, yeah. uh, what, what are some of the things you you teach? So really one of the main distinctions is to make the subtle difference, but equally massive difference between what I call 1.0 mindset, which is what we could call ego or persona. And then this new era of humanity that I speak to, which we could call soul or spirit, right? So these are somewhat everyday uh, words that are part of people's lexicon. Um, but really delineating them and understanding that they are part of our humanity. And so I break down human being, for example, as the beginning of my mastermind. I say the human is the hardware. The human is the mind and the, uh, sorry, the body and the brain. And then the being is the soul and the spirit. And the mind is kind of the bridge between the two, right? You know, with all your work and meditation and yoga that they look at the koshas, like the different levels, right? And so what I'm working on is something I call the perceiving self, which is our own identity. And then we have the soul, the perceiving self is the bridge. And then we have the, the faculties of our equipment, right? If you get into a Range Rover, you're going to have a different experience in terms of what's available to you than if you get into like a beaten up old Honda Civic, right? So, but you as the quote unquote driver are intact. There's nothing missing, but the degree to which you get to express yourself and create based on the equipment is why it's important for me to take care of this meat suit. That's why Ayurveda was such a beautiful supplement to my work. 
So really what I'm looking at is in the tenets of mind architecture is to go, okay, by default, my, my assertion, Peter Crone's assertion is that we have 10 prisons that we all arrive with. And that's what's going to be the foundation of my book. So if you were to ask, what's the 10? I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yeah, 10 prisons or prisons? Pri prisons, constraints, okay. limitations. Okay. And some of them we transcend just by virtue of maturity. We go through hard knocks and we realize we get a little help. We talk to a therapist. We talk to a friend. We talk to a priest, whatever it is. And we may be just through our own um, growth, you know, transcend, but some really define us. So for example, one that everyone can relate to, one of the prisons is the feeling of not being enough. It's an inherent part of the ego that by design, it feels insufficient. Now, you may not have had a parent who berated you or criticized you for getting a B as opposed to A, as much as that's a very uh, stereotypical uh, archetype for kids. Uh, one of my athletes, baseball players, he would go four for five, which is a baseball player's epic. You know, you're batting 800. If you're a 300, you know, you're a Hall of Famer. But he would still still to seem miserable. And, you know, I would investigate. And I was like, why, why are you down? You just, you, you were basically the MVP of the game. And he's like, well, you know, it just reminds me of my dad. He would always say, what happened to the fifth a bat? Like, why didn't you get it? You know, so you can start to see that that not enoughness is insidious. It's part of the human psyche. We can all relate to it. A girl isn't pretty enough. A guy isn't strong enough or tall enough or wealthy enough. You know, a girl doesn't her boobs aren't big enough or wh whatever it is. The not enoughness is it's, uh, it's, it's replete in the human condition. And so mind architecture is when I worked with someone, they would tell me whatever they're dealing with. It could be a physiological issue. They could be sick. They could have a relationship problem. They could have a, uh, uh, an emotional sort of feeling of depression, anxiety, whatever it is. Um, they could have financial problems. And what I do is I reverse engineer whatever the problem is into one of these prisons, sometimes two. And so as I reveal... Because whatever we're conscious of is an extension of what we're not conscious of. So the subconscious prison or constraint is the genesis for the thoughts, feelings, actions, and outcomes, right? If people follow that, that cascade, who we are at the deepest level for ourselves is what creates how we think, feel, consequently, the choices and behaviors we have, which always gives rise to the results we get, right? And if you understand that, it's very powerful. When we go and see an expert, most people focus on actions. Well, don't do this, do that, right? So you're sort of too far downstream because you might be able to sustain that for a while if you have willpower, like trying to quit smoking, quit drinking, like don't do this and do that. But they don't understand that at the deepest level in their subconscious, who they are for themselves is not good enough. They're not loved. They're not wanted. Something in the not bucket, N-O-T, which is a resistance to self, which creates suffering. And then we seek to escape suffering. In this case, those examples might be nicotine or alcohol. So unless you deal with the deep prison, then at best, you might get temporary relief because of willpower or shame, you know, because your partner is making you wrong for something. So mind architecture is really getting to the root cause of these psychological constraints and limitations and through investigation, uh, negating the validity of them, meaning to see that they're not true. Like if I were to open up light, you know, where am I going to find this not good enough? It doesn't exist as part of your hardware. It is simply a conversation. And so when people see that, the epiphanies that arise are just so moving, along with often a lot of emotion, right? Because they may have been living in this world for 30, 40 years, confined, and they have the people-pleasing perfectionism as a coping strategy, which is now creating their Hashimoto's because they're exhausted from trying too hard, blah, blah, blah. And then they realize it's all built on this very, very shaky foundation of some feeling of inadequacy. So I pull the carpet from beneath a whole persona and reveal this new world of, you know, pure possibility and ultimately my main product, as you know, which is freedom. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.